can I share this with you? If you feel like you're tired and been dumped into a dark place. So in this vision, it, that's what happened. I was in this dark well. I could look up, but I, I didn't have the strength to climb up the well. Okay. And so what the picture I got was uh, prayers of friends who came down, swooped down into the well, kind of got muddy with me, but they picked me up, wiped off the mud, dusted me off, and they helped me climb back up the rope out of the well. Now, the well was at the edge of a vineyard, and they're basically, they didn't shove me, but they basically said, hey, go deep in the vineyard. This is between you and the Father. This is just our assignment with our prayers was to get you out of the well, which was really beautiful. So I went deeper and deeper into this vineyard, and the deeper I went, I could feel the Holy Spirit just wrap his arms around me. I mean, it had been a cold, dark place in that deep place in the well, but the intimacy of the Father and, and the Holy Spirit was just, was just strengthening me. I got to the very end of this one row, and there was the vineyard. He had a table, like a picnic table laid out. He had some fruit and some bread. And he was drinking coffee. And he summoned me over. It was so precious, his vision. I sat next to him. He said, do you want me to hold you? I held, he held me. I cried. He wiped my tears, set me back down, and poured me a, hep, a cup of coffee. The Holy Spirit and Jesus joined us. And it was just a time of refreshing as the refreshing in their presence and supping with them i felt the strength and the holy spirit said hey you haven't dropped your sword i said oh that's good but the father said keep it in its sheath because that this this picnic table was at the base of a mountain he says keep it there you don't need it sticking out you're, you're gonna climb that mountain it's like okay so I'm just going to obey the Father. So after I had some wonderful fellowship with him, I started climbing the mountain. and The Holy Spirit was there to kind of help me along. Jesus was took my arm. I had the Father down below. And I'm just obeying, climbing this mountain. It wasn't real steep, but it wasn't real big. And I got to the top of the mountain. And as far as I could see left, there's a little vineyard. As far as I could see center place, there's a bigger vineyard. And far on the right, there's just a majestic view and territory. And then from my right side, a couple friends came in. It wasn't like a near-death experience. They were alive. They had made the climb before me. They're the same ones that pulled out of the well. It's like, boom, there they are. And there's David. And and. It was just like this This vision was just like the Lord saying, you need to release people. They Some of them are caught in the well. Some of them don't know. They're out of the well, but they don't know where to go. They don't know they can go deeper and deeper into realms of my glory. And in that deep place, find a table in the wilderness and be able to be strengthened for the next mountain climb. And it wasn't like when I got to the top of the mountain, I saw another mountain. No, it was just a place to rest. It was a place to declare over the land that I could see using my voice. And, um, and then I thought, well, you know, I was thinking about this. Lord, what if someone really desires those kind of friends that will pull them out of the well? And God reminded me of Psalm 15 which I used a couple of years ago as my friends, we were all going separate directions. Not There's no hurt. We we're just in different circles. And God said, pray Psalm 15 of as your declaration for the few friends you have and the friends that you desire. And Psalm 15 in the passion was just so, so real to me because I believe when you put that in God's hand, he can accelerate even the time that he connects you with people. So I just make that declaration of glory over you. And I hope that helped. I hope that brought some peace and strength. I was sharing about uh, the desiring visions and encounters. And of course, this is a new uh, course of identity restoration. Right. Um, Identity restoration and dealing with trauma. So I know you've been praying that let Mike is live. I know, I saw that. It's, oh my uh, goodness, it's been a week of encounters. Yeah. So four or five mornings ago, I was awakened with an audible voice that said, Life, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. An audible voice. 
I got up, it's in the wee hours in the morning, the sun hadn't rose, you know, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, that's pretty cool. <laughs> What's life and life more abundantly look like? What does it feel like? What is that like? Wow. So then yesterday, or last night, I should say, at 151, it was like a thud, and I was awakened. And I looked over, and it was 203, and I'm thinking, wow, 12. That's interesting because Teresa had gotten a text, and somebody had sent her a text that said 12, 12, and she was kind of laughing going, all these numbers, because you don't get numbers I do, you know, so it's funny. And then I'm like, wow, that was so interesting. So I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and then at uh, 5 o'clock, I heard another voice that said, today. It was just as clear. And about three minutes later, it sounded like a wooden, somebody hit a hammer, like a judge's gavel on wood. And it was on Teresa's side of the bed. And I said, Teresa, what was that? She said, I don't know. I think it was my AirPod or my earbud or something. <laughs> so she gets up. The first thing she says to me this morning is, I don't know what that was. I couldn't find anything. So I just laughed. And I didn't process anything with her, you know, but God has a way of speaking to us in encounters and he wants us to experience him in all five of our senses. So you can imagine how I felt when I walked around the end of the couch a week and a half ago and I smelt frankincense. Mm. It was so strong. I backed up four feet Wow! just so I could inhale it and breathe it. And I said, Jesus, what is going on? And he reminded me how I sat in that room and prayed. And he told me that that was the smell of our prayers on his incense altar in heaven. In the throne room, it was like frankincense. Our prayers are like frankincense in his nostril. Wow, that was so cool. What a fragrant relief. And what a release for me knowing that, you know, when you're walking in the midst of a traumatic experience or you're you're being attacked or whatever you're going through, you know, you don't have to get up under the drama of the trauma, and you could just keep walking in peace. And what a relief for me to hear God say, you're my son, and I'm well pleased. You know, the last thing Jesus heard before the attack of the enemy, driven out in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, the last thing he heard was, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So he didn't have to doubt when the enemy came in and said, if you be the son of God. It had, no, 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 no. He was the son of God. He knew who he was. And God wants us to move in such a realm that trauma can't move us off the perch of our peace and joy. That's what the enemy's after. And, uh, of course, you know, with with everything we've been going through, and some may know and some may not know, but it was so funny because God said the storm is not the trauma nor the drama of everything that's going on in your personal family life. The storm is the war on your voice. I want you to understand that everything you're going through is the storm or the attack of the enemy against your voice because he wants to shut you down. He wants to stop you before you liberate so many other people. And we come together in unity and we move in the realm of the supernatural to eradicate darkness. That's his whole job, still kill and destroy. He wants to steal your joy, steal your peace. What? Kill your voice, destroy your opportunity for your destiny, but he can't do it. So when we're moving in the realm of trauma and we're trying to get over trauma and the enemy just keeps throwing poo at us, we got to figure out what we're going to do with it. And it was so funny when I watched Gordon Ramsay the other day because the Lord said, you know, some places use poo for fuel. And so it was so funny when this guy was making rye whiskey what he used to fuel that furnace to make that rye whiskey was sheep poo. <laughs> you know, in Africa, they use elephant dung, you know? So there's different places all over the world. that, And so God says, whatever's coming against you, the fodder that's left behind, you'll use to fuel your future destiny. It's going to propel you forward. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, it's not easy when you're walking through all this crap. You know, you got your emotions, you got your feelings, and you know, you want to go against these people and you want to curse them. And God says, keep your thoughts and mind your tongue because I will establish your thoughts and I don't want you to release a curse. And when you love and you love deep, as an apostolic anointing is flowing over you, the last attack of the enemy 
in the apostolic realm is unreciprocated love. So when you love with everything that's inside of you and you don't get that love back, that's unreciprocated love. That's the final apostolic test on your faith. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus got when he was sent to the cross. He had loved and he had loved well. All who come to him were healed. Wow. He raised the dead, opened the eyes of the blind healed the lame. Just think about the, the lifestyle of Jesus for three years in ministry right there amongst his own people. And the last thing he experiences <clears throat> is crucify him, crucify him. Wow. And God says to us, you haven't yet resisted under bloodshed. But it feels mm-hmm. like it. Sometimes your heart feels like it's bleeding, doesn't it? Wow. Wow. Never let the enemy so discourage you that you forget about the joy of the risen Savior. Mother Teresa penned that a long time ago. Your tongue is the pen of a ready writer. If you don't write it down, you're going to lose sight of it. So the most unlikely place that you'll find the growth is in the crushing. This is the craziest thing. This is when you get pushed in that when you love God, no matter how strong the crushing is, it pushes you into a deeper level of God's love. You learn to see things the way he sees. You may never understand it. And I hope you don't drive yourself crazy trying to figure out why. You cannot be responsible for other people's choices. You can't get up under the burden and the responsibility of somebody else's choices. If you, you're just, you're defeating yourself when you do that. Right. You cannot be responsible for choices that other people make that are negative. On a good day, I do well to manage me. That's what he says, right? That's what he tells us to tell other people. We say it a lot, you know. When we we get together and we come together in corporate worship, we come together to empower and encourage one another. And what we've come together for is, is, is to worship Jesus. You know, we love the corporate worship thing. But if I can't get up early in the morning and worship Jesus by myself, if I can't come down in my living room and just fall on my face and just cry and say, oh, Papa, I love you so much. See, when I go into the worship realm, I don't go in there with expectations of what I can get. I don't go in there with a list of what I need or what I want. I go in there with awe and reverence. I go in there with respect and honor. I go in there with love because of what he's already done. It's not that I need anything else. He's been so good to us. Hallelujah. You think about the word, the word comes alive, especially during trauma, the word will come alive. The enemy plants a thought. And as soon as you recognize that it's an enemy's enemy's thought, you want to bring that thought into captivity. And the way you do that is any thought that comes into you that doesn't sound like a perfect loving father is not his thought and it's not your thought. Why? Because you belong to him. You've been hidden in him. You're hidden and engraved in the palms of his hands. Okay. Okay. You now have his mind. You have his intellect. You have his DNA. You're seated in the heavenly realm with him. Hallelujah. Wow. You're bilocational. How about that? You're seated in the heavenly realm with Jesus. Wow. As Jesus is, so are you. So any thought that comes in that doesn't sound like a perfect father, well, you know, it's not him. I cracked up laughing and I hadn't shared this, but with, with too many people, but this was so funny. The other morning I raised the blind in the kitchen And it was so funny because there was a frog in the corner of the glass. And I could remember when it got real cold, I'd move the plant inside. And I cracked up laughing because Elvin said, I hadn't seen my frog lately because it likes to hang out and get on the bush over there on the corner of the house. And it was so funny when I seen that thing, I said, oh, I got to get that nasty thing out of here, you know. And I'm laughing at myself thinking, oh, it's so gross. And I got a paper towel, you know, and I got it. There's no way I was going to hurt it. It's been around the house for two years. And so I started laughing, putting it outside, because when I brought that big point set of flower basin in, I didn't see no frog. I didn't even think about a frog, you know. And then I started cracking up laughing because I had saw – Earlier, two days before, I saw a, a little fly come in, but I, I could never find the fly. Well, guess what? I finally figured out what happened to that fly. <laughs> I figured out why God put that frog in my house and got rid of that fly. <laughs> I had some gnats that were swarming, and I had some ripe bananas, and I'm thinking, well, that's strange. All those gnats disappeared, but you know what I recognized is when I raised that blind, I recognized where all those gnats and all those flies went. They were good food in a frog's tummy. (laughs) 
And then I started laughing at the simple things of life. The real, real simple things of life. Elvis said to me, I hadn't seen that frog. And I'm thinking, it was so early in the morning. I'm thinking, I ought to call her. It's 4.30 in the morning. I ought to call her and wake her up and say, I found your frog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Jesus. Yeah. He's got a sense of humor. Oh.